What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke aka Dansgrate here and welcome back to this Final Fantasy X challenge that I began recently. First of all, I want to thank everyone so much for the huge reception for part 1. It kind of surprised me how many people were interested in and enjoyed the first part of this challenge. This is part 2 of this challenge, so if you haven't seen the first part, that's where I explain what this challenge is, what the rules are and what it entails, and of course, how I got from the start of the game to pass Sinspawn Gree at Operation Mehen. So if you've missed that video, you should definitely watch that one first before continuing from here. I am happy to report that there is more to come from this, and I hope you guys enjoy the second video in the series, and we are going to be continuing from where we left off after Sinspawn Gree, and we'll be heading towards Seymour and Anima, which was a really serious and interesting battle. So I hope you guys enjoy it. We're going to head straight back into the action with the same kind of format, showing you guys what I've been doing, the highlights, and talking about how I've made it through the run so far. So as you did for the first part, if you do enjoy this video too, please do remember to give it a like. It really did help get that first part off the ground and reach a pretty wide audience. So let's get into it and continue the Final Fantasy X auto battle slash attack only challenge. So with Sinspawn Greed done, it was time to move on to Jose. And by this stage, I was feeling pretty confident because I thought I've grinded a fair bit to defeat Sinspawn Gree, so I assumed that I was pretty overpowered for Jose High Road. And to be honest, I kind of was. And that was pretty good because, of course, you have the Basilisk there that can cause petrification, and I didn't really have all-round protection for petrification. So with the help of stuff like the Poison Touch weapon and generally like the, the power that the characters had at this stage, I had the Sunny Steel at my disposal, I had Poison Touch, I had Stone Touch, and so a combination of all of those things, plus the strength that I already have, helped me to get through Jose High Road pretty unaffected using Auto Battle. Of course, I'll show you guys a few highlights from them, just like some of the most difficult encounters that you can potentially face, and they were fine. Uh, if, let's say, you found a way to get through somehow without grinding as much, uh, maybe this bit would have been harder because of uh, the Fungars and those guys. Like, if you can't take those out, in one hit then you have sleep and petrification which could be of course a horrible combination depending on the kind of armors that you have so um, it could have been harder but honestly i think for most people you're going to have to grind hard to, to get through sinspawn gree and therefore this section ends up becoming relatively easy now if you want to hang out here it's probably a, a good place to hang out for a little bit at least until you get some stone touch because you're going to see uh, later on that i actually regret not hanging out here longer uh, because I'd already grinded a fair bit, I was actually excited to, to just keep going and see what the next roadblock was going to be. And so I pretty much just made like one run through and that was it. And I just kept on going once I passed Jose. But in hindsight, I probably should have hung out here longer to get a bit more uh, stone touch and stone ward. I did slightly regret it, but it wasn't too big a deal. And I'll explain why uh, when it becomes relevant. But I did make it through Jose unscathed and it was on towards the Moonflow baby. In the Jose Temple, if you do the Destruction Sphere, you get a Magic Sphere. And honestly, I was just giving these to Yuna because I was using her healing in the menu. And so obviously, the more magic she has, the more healing she can do. So that was pretty simple. But obviously, in general, magic is not going to serve you at all other than menu healing in this game. If you choose to use that, I mean, like I say, if you're really going for the grindy, absolute kind of purest thing, you can use items. But then technically, you could say you're using the item menu instead of the a magic spell so again it's all swings and roundabouts this totally depends on how you're feeling and what you want to do and how you're going to enjoy the run the most so the moon flow once again wasn't too bad because the main problem on the moon flow is of course the ochu has 7200 hp which is pretty serious but by this stage we do have some poison protection and we do have the TKO. So when you combine those two things, it wasn't too bad. And I decided to just kind of go for it and see what I could do. Tylus did have a Flame Tongue as well. And I thought he's got pretty high strength already. And then Fire Strike as well. It just meant that even if uh, Stone Touch wasn't working, I felt pretty confident that the three Musketeers would be able to do enough damage to, to take out Ochu without too much issue. And in general, that's how it worked out. I mean, Tylus was doing about a thousand damage and so was Kimari. So we had a Heat Lance and we had a Fire Weapon for Tidus too. So when you put those two together, we managed to, to take out Ochu without too much problem. 
even when the TKO wasn't working as well as it should. Now I did have one unlucky encounter where it did Oshu dance like multiple times and it did cause me a bit of problems because of course it inflicts darkness and so I could have given one of the guys a dark ward, I didn't really think about it at the time but that would have definitely helped as well. So even in a situation like this where things got a bit hairy because I literally had um, silence, darkness and poison like at the same time to deal with, we still made it through because like I say these guys are pretty OP at this point and they're generally they're generally like on track to be able to, to defeat most bosses up until I would say around the Makalania area where things started to get a little bit more um, back on track. So the Moonflow ended up being pretty breezy and it led me towards the next boss battle which was Extractor. Now as you might imagine for Extractor I had Stunning Steel for Titus which slows it down and Waka had a Thunderball which helped do more damage as well. So. This guy, even with no sphere grid restrictions, you can beat it if you have uh, the right equipment. So with this particular challenge, I definitely wasn't worried. Uh, auto battle is disabled for this one for some reason. I don't know why. Um, considering the fact that you can even have it against Sin Spawn Gui, why you can't against this guy, I'm not particularly sure. Maybe it's just because there's a trigger action um, based on like what happens when it swims up. I don't know. But in any case, we were able to make mincemeat of it because we had the Thunderball and we could slow it down too. So Extractor was no trouble at all. And that meant I could cross the Moonflow, head to Guado Salam, and then make my way out to the Thunder Plains, which ended up being a potentially important area in this run. Now, this was pretty weird because of course this is the part of the game where you get Riku and normally whether it be a normal run whether it be no sphere grid Riku is always so important and well especially like once you get a feel for the game and you start to understand how important and useful steal and use is Riku basically becomes like a guaranteed party member but for this one because of generally like her low HP her attack is worse than the three musketeers and while steal and use is not going to be used either it's like, well, how useful is she in this situation? And the answer is not very. So in the end, Riku ended up not really being used at all because her three most useful tools, which are Steel, Use, and her Overdrive, we can't use them in the challenge. So that meant that Riku kind of ended up being bypassed. So we just kind of headed on towards Guado Salam, uh, dealt with the storyline business there, and before long, it was on to the Thunder Plains. Now the Thunder Plains is a very interesting area. There's a lot to do here and it can be potentially dangerous as well. So as I said earlier, one of the most important things is to try to have the counter element for any elemental random encounters that you face. Here the gold element has a lot of HP, appears alongside dangerous enemies and has a pretty powerful uh, thunder of its own. And so if you don't have any water strike at all in the party, it's going to take so many hits to take that guy down, even if you have good strength, because of course it has very high defense as an elemental. And so this was somewhere where I had to make sure I made use of my elemental attacking weapon. So I had a liquid steel for Titus. For Waka, I kept the TKO because of course we have other enemies besides that guy. And for Kimari, I had a Tidal Spear as well. So two characters with Water Strike and Waka's TKO and I tried to defend against lightning as best as I could. Now, originally I gave Kimari uh, the snake head. I got a little bit cocky here. That ended up being a bit of a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Um, I tried to see if maybe against the iron giants and stuff, the, the poison would, might be a better choice. But I realized pretty quickly that that was not a smart move because we had an encounter that ended up going a little bit like this. Tidus got petrified and well, Kimari was doing less damage because he had a non water strike weapon. So this meant that Waka and Kimari basically took an absolute age to try and defeat the gold element. And by that time, Kimari ended up getting confused and things just really went to shit. So this ended up being an almost horrible, horrible encounter. We barely pulled through. But this is an example of how things can go wrong. So end up working in the end, but <laughs> definitely a treacherous area and a lot of things to watch out for. So after a few battles in the Thunder Plains, I decided to change things up. I gave Kimari a Confuse Ward, and I was looking for a Confuse Ward for Waka. I knew he had one because he was dropped to Lucid Arm Guard, 
And then I realized that for some reason this lucid arm guard had stonewalled on it too. And then when looking back at my recording I noticed that an Ochu in the Moonflow dropped me a super clutch armor that had stonewalled and confused ward on it. The odds of that happening are pretty damn low. I'll probably calculate it and like put it up as an annotation for you guys to see. But that was basically like the best armor that I could have asked for here because of course the two biggest statuses to deal with in the Thunder Plains are gonna be confused and petrification. So that was awesome. And so once I started doing that, I was like, this is just great. Then of course I realized that I was an idiot and that the, the Brotherhood had been fully powered up too. So instead of using Liquid Steel, I switched to the Brotherhood, which of course has plus 15 strength and Water Strike. So once I got to that stage, I started to get much more comfortable here because um, I had the Elemental Protection. I had a Confused Ward for Waka and for Kimari. I had the Brotherhood for Tylus, I had the TKO. And in general, I was just I was feeling pretty good about myself. And over time, especially since there's plenty of save spheres there too, I really started to, to crunch my way through uh, the Thunder Plains too. And I managed to, to make decent progress. So I made it all the way to the Thunder Plains agency and then I remembered something. Again, knowledgeable players at this stage would have already thought about this, but at the time I'd completely forgotten until I made it to this particular point. And I was like, wait a minute. I need to do some lightning dodging. And if you're wondering why, the answer is because, of course, everyone is always fixated on what happens if you dodge 200 lightning bolts. But what we often fail to remember, me included, is what happens if you dodge 50 of them? And the answer is if you dodge 50 consecutive lightning bolts, the game gives you three strength spheres. Now, <laughs> when your strength overall is only in like the mid to high 20s anyway, you quickly realize that a plus 12 in strength is going to make a massive, massive difference to the game. So, of course, I was like, well, guess who's going to be lightning dodging? Now, this was actually another one of those kind of philosophical crossroads because normally, whenever I've done lightning dodging in this game, I've always done it in the post game and I've done it with no encounters on. And I was like, well, to be honest, I shouldn't have no encounters at this stage. So it would be cheating if I use the game's no encounters to um, to be able to give myself that and to make lightning dodging easier. So up until this point, whenever the games forced me to bend the rules, I have bended them. But this time, the game wasn't forcing you to do that. You're just doing like an optional challenge within a challenge to get yourself uh, three strength spheres. And so it it would just be straight up cheating if I did no encounters here. So I end up having to do something I'd basically never done in the game before, which was try to dodge a significant number of lightning bolts without having no encounters. And that was actually pretty damn difficult. So basically, um, what I didn't want to do was to run around because, of course, if you run around, you're going to trigger off an encounter. And because the lightning strikes are randomized, the way in which you screw up is when you have an encounter, you complete the encounter, and then you get a lightning flash within, let's say, half a second of you exiting the menu after you win the battle. And that's when you're most likely to screw up. And it makes the whole predictability aspect much harder to work with. And so I was like, you know what? Let me try to do this in a way where basically turn it into a no encounters without having no encounters armor. And so my strategy for that was to basically try and find a position on the map where I could basically kind of jam myself in and when Titus jumps, when there's a flash, he kind of just like boxes himself in so he doesn't end up moving at all, really. And that means if you don't move and you don't run, then you're not going to trigger off any encounters. So that was basically my strategy for doing it. But even then, it was pretty difficult. Uh, on my first attempt, I tried a bit more of an open area still, and I, I didn't really like how it played out. So I didn't really refine the whole kind of not moving strategy until my second attempt. Uh, on the first one, I managed 34 dodges, I believe, before I got hit. And then on the second one, I kind of changed my position and then I ended up uh, managing and I got to the 50. And that, of course, was a huge deal because three strength spheres is really going to change things in a massive, massive way. So it was definitely an interesting challenge, like trying to dodge 200 um, without using the crater trick and without having no encounters might be a genuinely like seriously seriously tough challenge but thankfully I managed to make it through and I did get to 50 and that allowed me to get the strength spheres that I needed to make progress. 
You do get a couple of MP spheres if you dodge 20. Um, not that useful to us in this challenge. I did give them to Yuna, again, for menu healing. I mean, every little helps. But um, it's obviously the strength spheres that we're after. Now, if you dodge 100 of them, you can get three HP spheres, which could potentially be very useful too. But for now, I was like, you know what? Again, I want to move on with the story and get to the next major bosses. If I do need those HP spheres for, let's say, Sferimorph, Crawler, Seymour and Animal or Wendigo, I can always come back here and get them at that time. As mentioned previously, Tidus is the character that I decided to really kind of spend all of my extras on because he's going to be around the most and he generally has like the, the best kind of rounded stats to, to help with this sort of stuff. So I'm giving him the Strength Sphere and the final main reason he gets them is because I've moved Kimari onto his grid anyway and so eventually Kimari will come down and pick up those extra strengths as well. So that's, that was my general thinking about it. And well, thinking ahead, I knew for a fact that Titus would be present in the Seymour and Anima battle. And so for me, at least, it was a, a no-brainer to give them to Titus to see if that was enough to, to get through the tough battles ahead. So yeah, I did spend a fair bit of time on the Thunder Plains. Again, uh, leveled up, picked up some more items and some more equipment. And of course, most importantly, I did manage to dodge the 50 bolts and get three more strength. So Kimari was stuck on 28 strength, but Tidus was all the way up to 34 now, and I still had two more strength spheres to play with once I had the empty nodes available. Once again, a good farming opportunity here, but I didn't want to make use of it at this point. It was one of these where I thought, if I do need it, I'll come back to it later, but for now I was looking to push forward. And in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, I am talking about SOS regen that is given to you by Iron Giant as a, as a bit of a rare equipment drop. So keep that in the back of your minds because that could definitely be useful. As you've seen, I literally cannot heal in these battles and SOS regen is going to be one of the first way that the game gives you in this challenge to do any kind of healing within a battle. But that said, I did fight a fair few of them and I didn't get any SOS regen, so I just didn't want to hang out and try to, try to basically farm for one. So I thought, you know what, let's continue on to Markalania and the next boss. Makalania, once again, in my mind, the thing that actually stuck out the most was the blue elements because they have a lot of HP and their water rasp spell is actually really powerful. And there's battles where you have two of them at once. So I figured I definitely need my lightning strike weapons available because those guys got to be taken out as soon as possible. So I made sure I gave Tidus a weapon that has lightning strike on it. And I also equipped Kimari with his thunder blade as well. Waka I kept with the TKO because that's still incredibly useful. But in terms of elementals, I went for, of course, water element protection in Makalani as well, and I got rolling. Thankfully, again at this stage, because of the stats that I have and the counter element, I was able to take out the blue elements without too much issue and managed to get through. So that wasn't too much of a problem. The other, of course, major enemy here is the Chimera, but once again, with the TKO and just the general power that I have with the characters, that guy was a pushover as well. And so Makalani was pretty much uneventful. You could auto battle your way through the entire thing without much risk. So the next boss that we encountered in this challenge was Sverimorph. And to be honest, I was feeling fairly confident, but there were a few things I wasn't quite so sure about. The first is that I need to make sure I don't have any elemental weapons because I don't want to change whichever element I am fighting against because I just can't control it and I'll end up healing it by accident. So I made sure everybody had non-elemental stuff for starters. Then of course armor-wise I tried to have as much elemental protection as I could. And since Tylus has a lightning proof armor and Waka has SOS Null Shock and Kimari has Thunder Ward, Basically, any encounter in which Sverimorv has lightning as the element would be the perfect outcome. So honestly, I think basically resetting until, until you get thunder was probably the best option. But the first encounter I had against it, it already used thunder. So that was just really lucky and it worked out pretty well. That meant that the first part of the battle especially was very easy. There wasn't really much to think about. Just watch the attacks go by and in general, it doesn't really do that much damage. Now. Things actually get more interesting in the second half of the battle because what happens with Sverimorph is that when it drops below 50% of its HP, it starts using a move called Press 50% of the time. What Press does is that it takes away 50% of your current HP. And so even though the, the little kind of 
I don't know what you call it, but it's, it doesn't have legs, but it's almost it's like a stompy kind of move. Um, the stomp move that it does at the beginning of the battle, it only does about 200, 250 damage, so you don't feel like it really hurts your characters that much. But in the second half, let's say if it spams press twice in a row, it's going to bring your characters down to pretty low HP. And that means that even that single stomp attack that does like 200, 250 is enough to take you out. So the second half actually is pretty difficult for Stray Morph. And if you don't have the right kind of setup for it, it is going to take you out. So that's the part that I was curious about. So I was watching like things go by and I was thinking like, can I survive for long enough to defeat the second form? Because it's another one of these enemies that is pretty resistant to physical damage. And so most characters, Kimari included, were not doing that much damage. And at 12,000 HP, that was a pretty serious amount to take out, considering I could barely do like 300 damage with Tidus, 350 with Kimari, and Waka did very little damage at all. So, so it wasn't quite the pushover that maybe you guys would have been expecting here. And so what ended up happening was that even though I did get pretty much the perfect start with Thunder being used instead of any other element, I actually died. I got the game over. It took me out because that press was just too much. And so, yeah, I failed. But once I did fail, I already knew what I could do to make sure I won. And that was basically to give Kimari an SOS Null Shock. Now, when I was in Guado Salam, I made sure I got the chest on the way to the far plane. So I had eight lightning marbles. And so what I did was to customize a second slot on a nice Null Frost armor that I picked up from the mechs in Luka. So I gave myself SOS Null Shock as well. And this meant that basically Tylus had Lightning Proof, Kimari had Null Shock, and Waka had Null Shock too. And so that meant Kimari would take notably less damage once he got down to about half HP. And even something like that would definitely go a long way. I also equipped the Avenger for Tylus as well. I forgot to do that. I thought any extra attack will help. Even if he gets like three counter attacks during the course of the battle, that's an extra thousand damage, which is definitely not insignificant. So with these extra little tweaks, I came back in and I was feeling pretty confident I could do it this time. But of course, on my second attempt, it used a different element than lightning. And so as a result, you guys get to see what it looks like when Sverimorph uses an element that you're not protected against. And water was pretty much the worst choice because none of them had any water protection at all. And so since they take about 200 to 250 damage every time, they attack Sverimorph and they do such little damage, it was a recipe for disaster and they barely made it to about half of Sverimorph's HP before they all got wiped out. And so basically what I had to end up doing was being patient and restarting the battle until Sverimorph decided to choose Lightning as its element of choice. The first time that that ended up happening after my failed attempts that was when I ended up winning, and it was the, the Null Shock and the Counter Attack that ended up making the difference for this one. And so I could progress on to the next battle. For this one, I decided to head straight into it. I figured my characters are pretty strong. Um, I do have Lightning Elemental stuff for them as well. I figured let's just go in, see if we could just auto battle, brute force it and make it through. And to be honest, it was pretty uneventful in that sense. We did have enough power to make it through. All it does is use Gatling Gun. If you don't take out the negator, it doesn't use anything else. And so auto battle doesn't work, but you can just attack the body until it dies. And so it was pretty uneventful in the end. It was a nice and easy one where you can hack it to death and it can't really do too much. But... This is the point of the video where basically I encountered the hardest enemy that required the most grinding to be able to get through. And so we are of course talking about Seymour and Anima. Man, this was a really interesting battle. Man, I had a lot of fun trying to figure this one out. Let's talk about Seymour and Anima. Now the first thing and the most important thing to mention is that this is one of those battles where you cannot choose who is in the front line. And the first time I did this, it was a bit of a shock because I completely forgot that that was the case. But it is Kimari, Yuna, and Tidus. Now, I'm lucky because, once again, Kimari is actually in this battle, and he's, of course, super useful. And my second best character for this challenge. 
And so the fact that it was Kimari and not, let's say, if it was like Riku or something there, then we would have been really, really screwed. But the fact that Kimari was there made it somewhat of a consolation. But it still means that we had a Yuna stuck in the middle with only 875 HP and basically she was incapable of doing any damage in the battle too. All she could do was absorb a few hits from Seymour and, well, more importantly later on, Anima. So that was problem one and that was already a pretty huge problem. Problem two, as you're seeing right now, is the fact that yes, Tidus has a lot of strength for this stage of the game. He's very OP. But he is facing Guardo Guardians who have Auto Protect basically and they have Auto Potion. And so Tidus is nowhere near strong enough, even with 40 strength, to be able to take these guys out. And so we encountered a hell of a roadblock here the first time we faced Seymour and Anima. The good news is that critical hits from Tidus were enough to take out the Guardo Guardians, but of course it's not really that reliable a strategy to try and rely on two critical hits to progress in the battle because during that entire time of course Seymour is more than chipping away at you with his level 2 spells and so unless you get super lucky and you get I don't know two critical hits in your first three attacks with Tidus there isn't really much you can do here and it's, a it's actually interesting I mean again it's another battle where auto battle is allowed and it's activated from the start which is pretty cool and it does add to the challenge and so since the first thing I tried to do was to do an auto battle run, the fact that I can do a significant boss like this with that restriction was definitely extra fun. But this one was definitely a big problem. But with all that said, in my first attempt, Titus actually came through and he got the two criticals and he managed to survive against Seymour because he was at the perfect point in the rotation where he was using a lightning attack and so Titus took zero damage. So I had already given up at this point because Yuna was dead, I knew what was to come and I thought Seymour would wipe out the rest of our characters before we even got to Anima and then that kind of really piqued my interest and I just had to see what was going to happen when Anima came out and well to be honest the inevitable happened and pain was used to give me the game over. As you can see on the screen, Anima has two moves. Anima either uses boost or uses pain. Now, what do you think happens when Anima uses pain? You die, and there is of course no way to revive a dead character in this situation. So how the hell are you supposed to defeat Anima in this battle? She has 18,000 HP and uses pain every other turn. This was pretty devastating when I saw this and I was like, we have a lot of work to do to be able to defeat Anima. So after seeing that first attempt for me, it was back to the drawing board. I had to think really hard about what I could do here. And honestly, sometimes the best answer is the most obvious one. When you have restrictions like this where you can only use auto battle, you don't really have any other choice but to be able to do as much damage as possible and to defeat Anima before she wipes out your entire party. Because you don't have access to haste, you don't have access to any Phoenix Downs, you don't have any access to healing during the battle, and of course you don't have access to your summons or anything like that. So the only choice we have is to do enough damage to Anima to kill her before she kills us. It was that simple. This meant that I had to power level. At this stage of the game I had to get Tidus powerful enough that he could end up killing Anima before she could kill us. Now, the fact that she uses boost means that she takes 50% more damage. So that capability, combined with Tylus's three strength spheres and making a lot of progress on the sphere grid, made me believe that I could get there if I had the right kind of RNG. So at this point, I decided to take a pretty major timeout to level up and to, to really get these characters moving further down their sphere grids to be able to do enough damage to take out Anima according to the restrictions of this challenge. So the general idea for me was to basically try to kill a few birds with one stone here and to first spend some time in Makalania because that gave more AP to level up Tidus and Co. This time I also leveled up Yuna because of course before all of this, before even going into the run, I knew for a fact that we'd have to spend some time in the Via Purifico where Yuna would be in the front line. And so as a result, Yuna would need a little bit of help in the first place. And so this was a good time to finally get Yuna some of those levels that she would need for this battle 
and for the Via Purifico. Now, the reason why this is important in this battle especially is because what we need to happen is for Yuna to be alive when Seymour summons Anima. The only way you can realistically win this battle without an obscene amount of grinding is for Yuna to take the first hit from Pain. That buys you enough time for Titus and Kimari to get more attacks in and to hopefully finish off Anima before she wipes out the entire party. So that would mean that Yuna has to survive long enough. And the only way to do that is to, of course, help Yuna to level up. So at this stage, my general idea was to basically swap in individual characters and rotate them round and give Yuna, Riku and Auron some extra levels alongside Tidus, Kimari and Waka. So that was the first thing. I did spend a decent amount of time in Makalania grinding and helping some of the other characters get up to speed as well. Not to the extent of Waka and Tidus and Kimari, but just enough to really help them out in this particular battle. Now the trouble with this was that I quickly realized that by this stage of the game, I can't backtrack to Makalania. So I had to load the save before Sferimorph to be able to do that. And so it wasn't a big deal. I mean, I have been saving a lot along the way. And so I just reloaded that one and I took it from there. So that was phase one. Basically spend more time moving down the sphere grid with Tidus enough to use all of his strength spheres and to gain a couple more strength nodes along the way as well because he really needs to have basically around 50 strength or so to stand a decent chance of being able to, to take these guys down and alongside that i did manage to level up some of the other characters as well so around midway through the leveling up process i decided to backtrack further to the thunder planes once again because i did mention sos regen armor and i thought going forward this isn't really the kind of armor that drops very often, and so I decided to try and at least get a few characters an SOS regen. Now, based on the mass, I believe you have around a 3% chance of Iron Giant dropping an SOS regen armor. And let's say he drops it for Lulu or for Riku, then that's not going to be very useful to you. So it does take a decent amount of farming. So that's why I spent quite a long time in the Thunder Plains and I did defeat a lot of Iron Giants trying to get some SOS regen for the party. So again, multiple stones. We are picking up more equipment and stuff in general. We are leveling up characters and we are hopefully getting specifically SOS regen. That was the general process that I took before trying to return to Seymour and Anima to finish the job. Now, something pretty insane that happened during this, uh, this run, when I was returning back to Seymour, like I said, I had to reload the save before Sferimorph, and that meant that I had to beat Crawler again. This time around, when I defeated Crawler, I actually got a pretty crazy weapon for Kimari, which I really was not expecting. There is a pretty low chance of Crawler dropping an alchemy weapon, and the odds of an alchemy weapon being dropped and it being dropped to Kimari is pretty damn low, so I got a really clutch drop here from Crawler. And so at the moment, I can't really use it, but hopefully once I get auto abilities like auto potion and auto phoenix, then maybe this is going to come in really handy. Like that was a hell of a drop and it was very fortunate. And so yes, after a decent amount of grind, again, nothing too crazy thanks to the times 4 and auto battle. Things went by pretty quickly. And of course, since a lot of the other characters were pretty kind of behind to start with, they gained sphere levels very quickly. And so it wasn't too bad. So in terms of the stats that I needed to defeat Seymour and Anima, this is what I had before I went in for my winning attempt. Titus had 2,420 HP, 32 agility, and I pushed him all the way to 50 strength, which was absolutely huge for this point in the game. I don't think I've ever had Titus anywhere near 50 strength at this point in the game. So in that sense, it really has been a unique challenge for me because I'm always pretty anti like over-leveling for an area. But for me, at least, this was the level that was necessary to try and take down Anima because we have 18,000 HP to take out and we have very few turns with which to be able to do it. So the game kind of leaves you with no choice but to do some power leveling to really try to get you through and win the battle. I moved Yuna far enough along to hopefully survive a couple of magic spells as well. Uh, 1,675 is not too bad. And of course, you could equip her with the HP plus 10, but I kind of forgot that before the battle. <laughs> it definitely would have been smart because it would have helped her survive three spells instead of two. But yeah, in general, she had enough to make it through. And as for Tyus's partner in crime, Kimari, I had, of course, pushed him further along Tyus's grid and he'd got to the point where we used the first strength sphere. So he was up to 37 strength, a big 2,744 HP, but his agility was always a little bit lackluster 
and hopefully that picks up later on, but that's of course one of his weaknesses. So Kumari is of course still very powerful considering the part of the game that we're in, but compared to Tidus he is notably less effective attacking me. But hopefully the combination of Kumari's 37 strength and Tidus's 50 strength was going to be enough to take down Anima. In terms of equipment, I found that if I use something that doesn't have a strength booster, Tida still doesn't have enough strength to be able to take down those Guardo Guardians because of their auto potion and auto protect. So I found that if I equip the Brotherhood on him, that extra plus 15 strength basically ensures that he can one hit KO those Guardo Guardians and it's not a problem. In terms of armor, I didn't really pick up anything that had multiple elemental protection for Tidus, and I didn't want to use another SOS Null Shock, so I decided to just leave his Light Improved Yellow Shield and hope for the best. For Yuna, I made a mistake. I should have equipped the Red Ring, but I didn't because I forgot at what point she, she leaves the party, and I was so busy on all the other characters that I forgot to give her the plus 10% HP and the Fire Ward, so that would have been the smart thing to do, but I didn't do it. But fortunately, it wasn't enough to change the outcome of the battle. And for Kimari, of course, it's that trusty red armlet. It's always been a really useful and versatile armlet. And so with that, we were ready to take on Seymour and Anima and hopefully win once and for all. And man, it was seriously tense. I had so many attempts that I was just basically fast forwarding the first part of the game because it was just taking too long to do even with like, um, even with all of the cutscene skipping and stuff. Okay, so time for the winning attempt here. By this stage, with the Brotherhood as well, Tidus is able to one-hit KO the Guardo Guardians, which makes life a lot easier. So 50 Strength plus Brotherhood gets that job done, and this means that everyone's survival to Anima's form is guaranteed, basically. And that already takes out a large RNG element. But, of course, when Anima actually appears, that's when things get interesting. And you still, you know, this the stats that I have here are barely enough to get it done. And depending on RNG, so stuff like initial counter values, and depending on whether or not Kimari crits against Seymour, the turn order of Anima can shift here. So in this particular attempt, what you're going to see is Anima uses boost, Yuna gets called for the new Aeon, she attacks, does 76 damage, Kimari attacks, but then Tidus attacks afterwards as well. In the attempts that you've seen before, that did not happen, so I got some good... ICB slash RNG values here to allow me to get the extra turn in with Tidus, which made a huge difference here. And so you can see that basically Anima didn't even get a chance to use the second pain attack. That was just insane. Like that particular sequence there was just absolutely monstrous. The way that we took out Anima there was just crazy. So once that happened, obviously, it was a foregone conclusion anyway. Seymour was never going to stand a chance. So, made it look very, very easy in the end, but to get here, it took a lot of work. It really did. So, that was Seymour and Anima. It did require me to do a fairly decent amount of grinding and to get my stats high enough to, to make it work. But it definitely felt good to beat him in the end, and I was looking forward to seeing how far I could take this challenge. But you can see here, I mean, like, Tidus 50 strength, 32 agility, and a pretty big chunk of his sphere grid has already been filled out at this stage. And so I'm wondering, is it really just going to get to a stage where you completely blow the game wide open and you could just complete it like that? And even if so, I mean, I do wonder about the post-game. Like, can you, how much of the monster arena can you do? It's definitely impossible to do the entire game. I'm 99% sure of that. Um, but I'm sure you can do a very decent amount of it, including a lot of post-game stuff that maybe you wouldn't assume that you can do with just attack slash auto battle as well. But before we can get anywhere near thinking about that kind of stuff, let's look at more immediate concerns, because there is one final boss I'm going to show you guys for this video, and that is going to be Wendigo, because after beating Seymour and Anima, I was kind of instantly curious about what was going to happen with the next boss. Am I going to basically defeat it in like 15 seconds and just make my way through? But before we could escape from the temple and make our way towards Wendigo, there was of course the Cloister of Trials to do. And in that one, if you do the Destruction Sphere, you end up with a Lux Sphere. Now, especially in this challenge, being able to hit enemies and being able to get critical hits is going to be helpful. So you're not going to pick up that many Lux Spheres in this game anyway, so any opportunity you get for a Lux Sphere or a Fortune Sphere, you should probably pick that up. So that was the main thing to remember from the Cloister of Trials. I don't think it's a game changer if you don't get it, but it only takes a couple extra minutes, so I do think it's worth picking up the Lux Sphere. 
So from there it was time to make the escape out of Marcalania Temple. And the Guado Guardians already, they're not a problem anymore because Tidus has been leveled up significantly and so has Kimari. And this meant that I could pretty much blast through the escape and make my way out of there and start heading towards Wendigo to see what was going to happen against a notoriously pushover boss in a regular playthrough. The good thing about this battle, unlike Seymour and Anima, was that I could choose which team I wanted to have, so I of course went with Tidus, Waka and Kimari. In terms of equipment, for Waka I had picked up an SOS regen from the Iron Giant, so I equipped that anyway just in case it helped a little bit. Ultimately it didn't really, but I equipped it anyway. And I didn't really have too much else, so with this guy he pretty much just hits like a truck. Anything you have in terms of more HP or more defense is probably the best way to go. Now in terms of attacking stuff, he does have a lot of status vulnerabilities and that's one of the reasons why he's always such a pushover boss. At the time I didn't look it up, I just wanted to see if I could get through just with a few little statuses that could help me. So I went with Dark Touch for Tidus. And then for Waka, he didn't really have that much in terms of status. Uh, he had a Poison Touch, so I decided to try it anyway. And for Kimari, he also had a Poison Touch. So I just decided to go for that and just trigger the battle off and see what was going to happen. So I felt pretty confident about this one because I'd done so much work up until this point, And I was pretty sure that I'd be able to overpower this guy because I could take out the Guado Guardian and the fact that he has the status vulnerabilities as well just made me think surely I should be able to take this guy out and it should be fine. And so off to Wendigo we go. The same setup here, Tidus was strong enough and immediately got a huge critical hit to take out the Guado Guardian but unfortunately when the Guado Guardian dies it casts Protect on Wendigo which makes things worse. Now, the other one casts a Berserk, which again makes things worse, and we have no way of getting rid of these status effects. Normally you could just use an Asuna on him and get rid of the Berserk, but that's not working. And so immediately you're starting to realize why this battle was actually not quite as easy as I would have assumed. I'm doing big damage, but because of the positioning of the Guado Guardian, the game on auto battle actually prefers to hit Wendigo instead of the Guado Guardian. So this guy is able to continue to heal, make attacks and use status effects against our party and we're not able to take out the second Guado Guardian until we've dealt with Wendigo. So this ended up being a big problem here because this Guado Guardian has auto potion, the first one that we kill ends up using protect on him and because he's berserked he's just doing way too much damage for us to handle. And so this first attempt as you can see it pretty quickly ended up getting out of control because he was just doing like two and a half thousand damage to us and that meant they could either not survive any punches or survive an absolute maximum of one punch so Wendigo actually completely destroyed us in the first attempt that we had with the major reason being because the second Guado Guardian was also there and causing a lot of problems so immediately that was kind of a good sign I was a bit happy about that because I was like oh god this is just going to be like the next few bosses are just going to be a complete wipeout and well I was the one that got wiped out so I had to go back to the drawing board and have another look at this and see if I could find a way through because the protect and the sheer power and the Guado Guardian healing was causing big problems so I had to have a little look at what I had and try to see if I could make the situation a little bit better. So I decided to go for something a little bit different. I did pick up a Lullaby Rod from the Seymour and Anima battle, and I remembered that putting this guy to sleep was one of the most effective things that I could do. So I did something like that I wouldn't normally have done here, and I actually swapped Yuna into the party, because she's the only one that had the sleeping equipment, other than Lulu, who had barely any stats. So I decided to go with Yuna, Tidus, and Kimari, and make use of the sleep ability, because obviously, if I could time it correctly, I could put Wendigo to sleep before he got his turn, and that would mean I'd basically get a free turn. So making use of sleep touch was one of the first things I tried. Now, once again, depending on how much you drop farm and how lucky you get, you could have already picked up a sleep touch for Waka or Kimari at this point, but I didn't have a sleep touch for those guys, so I had to go with whatever I had at the time. And this meant that Yuna actually made a surprise appearance in this battle, even though normally she's kind of ill-equipped to take these guys on. So once again, Tidus comes in with absolutely massive damage and takes out the Guado Guardian because they don't have Protect in this battle. And I decided to test out and see what would happen if I had Yuna with Sleep Touch in the party and whether that would make a difference. So as you can see, it is making a difference, but depending on the turn order, sometimes you just immediately wake Wendigo again before the turn. Then I noticed something interesting. 
Wendigo missed Yuna. Now, Wendigo's accuracy is pretty low, and that means that someone with even Yuna's evasion is able to evade his attacks now and then, which is pretty huge, because you're seeing that when Wendigo does connect, the damage is absolutely obscene, and even at these levels, because I don't have stuff like Auto Protect, for example, and I can't cast Protect, there's not that much I can do here. So Wendigo, once again, was just absolutely destroying my party here. But I did see a few signs of things that could work, because I had Sleep Touch, and I was able to evade his attacks, especially if I had Darkness. So the pieces were starting to come together, but I wasn't quite ready yet to beat Wendigo. But seeing him miss a few times in this attempt made me think that it definitely was possible. But I did need to land a few more like Darknesses and get Sleep Touch to work and try to get this guy's HP taken out before he could wipe out the party. So then came attempt three, and this time normally I want Tidus to be using Dark Touch or Slow if that's possible, but he did have the Lullaby Steal, and so I did use that for Tidus. Now if you were to do more drop farming in the run, I think I would have had even more Sleep Touches by now, but at this point Tidus was the only other person from the main attackers that had a Sleep Touch weapon, and normally I try to use him for other statuses. And so initially I just decided to have Yuna with Sleep Touch just to test if it would work, and I kept Tidus with Dark Touch, and I tried to use those two statuses in tandem to see if I could make it work. So this time, for the third and what would be the final attempt, I decided to go for a double sleep touch setup here, because it was working pretty well, and I thought if two out of my three characters could put Wendigo to sleep, then the chances of Wendigo missing a turn due to being asleep would be fairly high. So I decided to give Tidus the lullaby steal that I had from before, and so again, we went with Tidus, Yuna, and Kimari in this one. So the work that I'd done on Yuna before, even increasing her HP a little bit, giving her some more agility and all of that kind of stuff, allowed her to be a factor in this battle. Now she was always one hit away from death, but at least when it comes to surviving some of the spells that the Guado Guardian could use and that kind of thing, she was able to do that. So we went in with this party. It was a bit more sleep heavy setup here. And this time we were actually able to get it done. So Titus came in with a massive attack once again. Guado Guardian dies, and then Yuna springs into action and does a massive 26 damage, which wasn't that helpful. But it would have been nice here if Kimari also had like a Dark Touch weapon or a Sleep Touch, but we couldn't make it work, but it's not the end of the world. What we did have here was enough to get it done. So as the battle continued to play out here, I got off to a fairly bad start, but then he missed Yuna, and I was like, okay, I'm starting to gain some momentum here. But as you can see, that sleep doesn't hit that effectively because he does have some resistance to sleep. So that means you don't have like a clean 50% chance of doing it if you have a sleep touch weapon. So it doesn't always work, but having two characters that had it definitely made a difference. And especially when Tidus has that much strength and lands a critical in the battle, it starts to make a huge difference because, well, 4,000 damage is about 20% of Wendigo's entire health pool. So it makes a big difference. As you can see, he ended up missing Yuna a few times as well, which definitely helped. And so the RNG was on my side here a little bit, but ultimately it was enough to pull through. I think all I needed to do was just give it a few more attempts and it would have always worked. But it's kind of funny how you take out Wendigo and then Titus just immediately springs onto the other Guado Guardian and takes him out. It's pretty hilarious. So with that, thankfully, without too much pain, we were able to actually defeat Wendigo and move on in the story. So that concludes the final boss battle for this particular video because there is actually a little bit more work to do before I carry on. So in this little outro, I'll explain what's going to come next. The thing I decide to do before starting the next set of recordings is to basically make sure that I picked up an SOS haste from Wendigo. As I've mentioned right from the start, one of the things that makes this challenge tough is that you don't get to benefit from haste for a very long time in the game. And picking up things like SOS Haste and, well, especially Auto Haste, it takes a very long time. And especially other than customizing it using monster capturing, picking up Auto Haste is, could potentially be impossible in this challenge due to how difficult it is to defeat the enemies that could give you it with the restrictions that we have. So for that reason, Wendigo is the earliest point in the game where you can actually get SOS Haste as a drop. And I felt like this is something that I can't not have in this run because you just never know when you're going to need it. Like my mind goes to something like Overdrive Sin where speed is of the essence 
And depending on how much power leveling we're able to do, it might actually be very tough to try and do all of that damage in that given time. So SOS haste is something that I definitely had to farm for. So this means that after this video and before the next recording session, I have to keep reloading the Wendigo battle and defeating him until I get a SOS haste for one of my main attackers. So Tidus would be ideal, uh, but Tidus Kimari or Waka is probably good enough to get me through. And so I'll keep farming this guy until he drops an SOS haste for one of those guys because it's just too big a thing to miss out on at the moment. And so that concludes this episode, my friends. I hope you have continued to enjoy this series. It's been really fun. As I said at the start, the response has been absolutely huge. And thank you all so much for the support. It's one of the biggest like responses I've had to anything I've done for quite some time. And I'm glad that there is more to come and that you guys are going to be able to enjoy it. And I'm going to be able to have a successful series like this that has a lot of support and a lot of backing. So a reminder that if you want to catch these episodes early before they release to the public, you can support me on Patreon if you are able to in order to get that early access. But if not, of course, the next episodes are always never too far away. We'll be continuing the series with Beacon L, Home, and probably going all the way to Seymour Natus at least and seeing how we do. Because some interesting things are going to happen. Like Yuna's going to be left on her own in the Via Purifico eventually. And we're going to have to try to get through there. Then defeat Isaru's Aeons with just using attack with our own Aeons. We'll see if that's possible or how much grinding is necessary for that. So there are going to be some interesting things to come in the next session too. And we're going to keep pushing forward to see how far we can take this. And maybe we're going to be able to take it extraordinarily far. I'm talking about like completing the game, the main story, but then also maybe doing almost all of the monster arena, doing the Omega Ruins, defeating Omega Weapon, all of this kind of stuff. So there could potentially be a lot of mileage left in this challenge, but I will be continuing to present it in this sort of condensed, highlighted format so that you can get tightly packed, dense content and it doesn't end up being like a, a long series that clogs up the channel and gets in the way of other content that I'm working on. So I'm enjoying this format too. Hopefully you guys are as well. And we will continue this series soon. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care.